tonight's consumer education event is being held to address the most pressing issues faced by consumers of financial services in this digital age. My name is Jesse Leonce and I will be your moderator, steering, navigating the insights and expertise of the following panelists. We have Ms. Harriet Perman, Director of Consumer Affairs within the Department of Consumer Affairs, Gordon Julian, Country Manager, at St. Lucia Republic Bank, EC Limited, Medford Francis, Medford Francis, Deputy Managing Director of Lending and Investments at Bank of St. Lucia, Nigel Oliver, Country Head at St. Lucia CIBC First Caribbean, and Ms. Vina Frederick, representative with the National Consumers Association. So I mentioned a few bankers there and they are representing the Bankers Association of St. Lucia. They will be making a presentation uh, this evening. So I do hope that uh, your eyes and ears are in on that presentation. But first, I just want to thank the panelists for availing themselves on this occasion and to thank the registrants, for those of you joining, viewership, for joining in and listening, and hopefully you can submit your queries, concerns, comments later on. Do rest assured that you will be afforded that opportunity. I open the floor now to the Director of Consumer Affairs, Harriet Herman, to deliver brief opening remarks on behalf of the government of St. Lucia, of course, speaking on touching on the benefits of utility digitization to the consumer and the work of the department toward the drafting of policy frameworks and the national at the national and regional level that support consumer rights in this digitization of the financial services sector. Ms. Herman, over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Leos. Good evening, fellow panelists, mistress of ceremony the listening and uh, viewing audience. I bid everyone a warm welcome. Thanks for the opportunity provided us, the Consumer Affairs Department, to provide an insight into the work of the department, which falls under the umbrella of the Ministry of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs. Um, we've not been given an opportunity to be able to touch base with our publics in a long time, given the pandemic. And as a result, I profit the opportunity to give you an insight into the work of the department. The department came into being in 1997 as the government of St. Lucia sought to honor its obligations under the regional and international, its obligation, sorry, to meet its regional and international obligations to protect consumers and also to address matters pertaining to anti-competitive behavior. The Price Control Department was transformed into the Consumer Affairs Department, broadening the scope of the department to encompass all matters pertaining to consumers. The broadened scope required that the appropriate legislation be developed to provide protection for consumers and establish guidelines for businesses to adopt. The move also required the department to assist with the establishment of non-governmental organizations to advocate on behalf of consumers to agitate for change where consumers' rights were infringed. Therefore, in addition to monitoring the importation and sale of price control goods, the department now had responsibility to one, that is receive, evaluate and process consumer complaints, conduct research on consumer issues and educate consumers on the work of the department and consumer protection in general. This evening's activity is one of, that fits nicely into the department's efforts to educate the public on matters of interest to consumers. We join, St. Lucia joins the rest of the world in celebrating World Consumer Rights Day, which, which is celebrated March 15th annually. And the theme being celebrated this year is fair digital finance. And hence the reason why we have our panelists, which, um, are the members of the Bankers Association to enlighten the public on the move from the traditional services into digital banking. Without further ado, I pass the um, mantle, so to speak, on to our colleagues from the Bankers Association to enlighten our public. Before we, we move on to the, the presentation itself, I, I know the bankers are anxious 
enthusiastic to make their presentation today. Uh, we just want to hear from Ms. Dina Frederick, representing the National Consumers Association on this occasion. A gentle reminder that this activity is a part of activities nationally in observance of World Consumer, World Consumer Awareness Day. So, Ms. Frederick. Thank you very much. Um, Rightly, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Jesse, and I would like to extend uh, a warm and hearty good evening to all um, who are made an effort to attend this evening's um, um, session. Um, consumer associations play a vital role in educating, advising, representing, as well as counseling consumers so as to enforce their rights. Um, they help reduce the imbalances between the organizations or the businesses and consumers by empowering consumers and giving them the confidence to make informed decisions. The National Consumers Association has been a champion for underrepresented consumers nationwide from as far back as 2001. We are a nonprofit organization um, that focuses primarily on advocacy and education, which in turn is responsible for empowering our consumers. There is no doubt that digitization has brought about many benefits to financial consumers, but with every new advancement that we make as a society and as a people, there are challenges and there are always risks. These risks include new forms of theft or fraud that is perpetuated online. Um, we see data breaches, we see lack of privacy and digital security incidents. And while statistics are not readily available to indicate how big the move from traditional and digital banking has been in St. Lucia, these consumer issues and concerns must be addressed. Now, I will just speak briefly to two concerns. One is security and the other would be the hot button issue of bank charges. Security has and continues to be a huge challenge and consumers are open to cyber attacks and fraudulent activity online. But often consumers are oblivious to the fact that their online habits may put them at serious risk. Fraudsters prey on poor privacy habits and on the part of the consumer and issues like weak passwords and using unsecured networks make people vulnerable to online attacks. Banks need to demonstrate that security of their systems to their consumers, and they also need to educate customers on improving their privacy and security habits to avoid online attacks like login credential theft and what we call phishing. Now on to the, the most talked about issue, which is uh, bank charges. There is something very upsetting about banks simply deciding that customers must pay a fee to withdraw their own monies. And there is the view that the banks utilize customer savings to make a profit. Customers detest banks simply resorting to the extremely parasitic act of arbitrary fees. And the fiercest and most powerful example of the official rejection of such financial parasitism came from the Prime Minister of Barbados, um, Mia Motley, wherein she admonished the commercial banks of Barbados to desist from their, par their financial parasitism and urged them to stop watching consumer finances like security guards, but to get busy instead in expanding their loan portfolios in the interest of the economic growth and the development of Barbados. As a member of the National Consumers Association, these are some of the issues we plan to soon take on, and it cannot be right to simply charge customers for every single transaction. And this is done without any consultation with the consumers who hold accounts in those banks. So I see this as an opportunity for us to discuss those very issues and for us to get consumers involved and educated as to what is happening and the consequences that comes about as a result of us now going digital with uh, financial services. Thank you very much, Jesse. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Vina Frederick, and doing a wonderful job, I dare say, uh, uh, representing the National Consumers Association. We've heard some of the concerns uh, aired by you, and of course, about the a prior event hosted by the Department of Consumer Affairs in collaboration with the Bankers Association of St. Lucia in highlighting some of these concerns. So hopefully we do hear 
from the team from the Bankers Association this evening uh, during their presentation addressing these matters. And I'm certainly sure if not then, but after when we have the queries and comments, we open the floor to our viewership, the individuals who have registered. So now to the three, three gentlemen who will be making the presentations. Uh, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Medford Francis, Deputy Managing Director of Lending and Investments at Bank of St. Lucia. We have Mr. Gordon Julien, Country Manager at the St. Lucia Republic Bank EC Limited, and Mr. Nigel Oliver, Country Head for the St. Lucia CIBC First Caribbean. Over to you three gentlemen. Thank you very much, Jesse, and good evening to all our participants. Um, let me just start by thanking the Ministry of Commerce for this opportunity to reflect a bit on the theme for this year, World's Consumers Day, which is fair digital finance. Um, we believe that you know this is quite a timely issue. Um, that, that we face. And um, I think the introductions by both um, Ms. Frederick and Ms. Herman um, are quite on point. I think um, through our presentation this evening, we will in fact address some of those issues. And of course, if there are still any lingering concerns thereafter, um, the floor will be open to further questions. So a very quick start um, to the presentation. Just to put this in context, what is digital finance? We've been hearing so much talk about it. It's really the use of digital technologies to administer financial services. It is one aspect of financial technology or what we call FinTech. Um, it introduces new products, applications, processes, and business models. Some of the new technologies that are actually driving digital finance include the social networks that we have seen crop up all over mobile applications, cloud computing, big data analytics, and blockchain technology. Um, blockchain is in fact what is driving our digital currency within the ECCU space, our digital XCD dollar, um, artificial intelligence, or commonly known as machine learning. So all of these technologies are in fact driving what we are now um, seen um, play out in terms of digital financial services. For us, digital finance is an imperative for many reasons because it drives competitiveness. It offers consumers options at lower prices. In terms of a seamless digital space, the fact that you are doing this remotely and, and, and virtually, um, it means it, it facilitates cross-border mobility in more ways than, than traditional channels would have. And of course, in terms of overall financial stability, it would contribute um, significantly in that regard. Of course, it unleashes innovation and creates opportunities for better financial products. And we will see some of that as we proceed. And of course, this issue of greater financial inclusion. And as I indicated in the, in the, in the opening, I, you know, the whole issue of whether it is, um, whether digital finance introduces some level of um, equity in terms of access to services. And we will certainly see that that is in fact the case because it, it really unleashes the potential for sectors within our population that traditionally were unbanked or underserved to now come into mainstream financial services. And of course, security and convenience, and, uh, and Ms. Frederick did speak to that a bit. And of course, um, there are safeguards, there are, there are protective mechanisms that ensures that your transactions in the digital space are in, fact, are in fact safe and secure. So what are the prerequisites to digital finance? Importantly, there is an issue of a good digital identification. And what do I mean by that? It means we need a, 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 a reliable way of authenticating one's identity and in such a way that it cannot be disputed. And that is the key really to digital finance. And in fact, it's the it's key to the digital economy that we've been speaking about in that without that, that means of identifying individuals or entities rather, um, it would be impossible to transact or to do anything. 
Um, so it's, it's a prerequisite and our challenge has always been, how do, we, how do we come up with a good digital identification system? Um, it, drives our, it could drive our health systems, our education, and you would have appreciated that even during the pandemic, we had situations where it was difficult to come to say the bank to do a transaction, but we had no choice but to have facilitated the in-branch transaction because there was no other way of verifying one's identity. So as a country, it is important if we are going to look at digitization in any significant way, that the basis for this should really be a good digital identification system. I make reference to the McKenzie Global Institute 2019 report on digital identification, which holds that emerging markets that are able to implement successfully a digital ID system can unlock GDP growth equivalent to about 6% of GDP on average by 2030. So that is very telling in that respect. And so we present this today as something to cut. That's something that we need to you know, contemplate a little bit on. Another prerequisite for digital finance and of course, um, digital transactions, the digital economy in general, is of course our broadband penetration. And I'm speaking to both fixed and wireless broadband subscriptions. In St. Lucia, in terms of mobile broadband, we have about a 48.1% penetration rate. And in terms of fixed broadband penetration, we have something like 11.3% penetration. And as you can see here, we are trailing the OACS, um, you know, as a, as a grouping. So in as much as we see the popular use of the devices, um, there is still a long way we have to go in terms of making um, broadband available to all. What are the digital banking services that we speak of? Um, I will just list them very quickly. We speak of online and mobile banking services, ATM cash dispenser services, debit and credit cards, point of sale services, telebanking, digital banking, which would include things like your online account opening, um, online loan applications, um, and virtual interviews for whatever the reason it could be for, the, for a loan or any, any other purpose. And of course you have what, what we see now is the introduction of a lot of what we call the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. All of these are, are simple, they're available 24-7, um, they are instant, they're convenient, they're secure, they're paperless. And of course there's enhanced support that you get from the use of those services. So there, there are a lot of benefits to them. Um, very briefly, our ATM services, and as you go from institution to institution, um, the, the, the range of features would vary. So we have access, in, access to your accounts, we have the transfer of funds, and these are generally available, um, you know, 24 seven. In terms of our online and mobile banking, again, you will see different levels of functionality or dif um, different levels of features as you go from institution to institution. But broadly speaking, we have, the ability to access your account safely and securely. You could transfer funds, you could manage payments, you can initiate wire transfers and what we call electronic fund transfers, which my colleague Gordon will speak to in just a minute. We have secure messages and we have other services such as top-ups and financial calculators. E-commerce is essentially refers to all aspects of operating a business online. And certainly online shopping is of course, um, the purchasing on goods and services online, very popular, um, especially now during these pandemic times, persons have found it more convenient to shop online and to conduct a lot of their transactions um, by, by the, those, those means. We have seen the digital models in different parts of the world. For example, the mobile payment systems, m in, in Kenya, Basically, it allows um, persons to digitally store, send and receive money cheaply through their mobile phones. We have seen platform ecosystems. Um, Alibaba, certainly if it's a large e-commerce platform, now has Alipay to go along with that. So you can see an integration of those um, technologies as part of one eco ecosystem. And very importantly, we have what we call the application programming interfaces that allow 
the exchange of customer data and instructions between applications. And that's very important in terms of being able to now extend services via third party providers. What are the benefits of digital finance? We saw it during the pandemic, certainly in a very big way. And in terms of cost and efficiency, um, this is information from the World Bank Group, which shows that today over 950 million registered mobile money accounts across 90 countries exist. And within, within those, there are about 1.3 billion transactions daily. So you can see the significance of mobile money. And um, it, is, it is a fact um, as indicated by the World Bank that this has served to reduce the cost of these transactions down from about 6.8% to 3.3%. So in terms of access and you know, being able to get cheaper services, digital finance certainly offers that, that benefit. Um, there are in fact some drawbacks and challenges. Um, for, for example, the financial institutions involved, there's a high cost of digital transformation. And on top of that, the very slow rate of adoption by our customers. And in fact, what that creates for us is quite a bit of a dilemma because we have invested in those systems, but persons are reluctant to start using them, which means that we basically now have to run two platforms, the traditional platform and the digital platform at tremendous cost. So part of, the, part of what we're doing within the industry is trying to find ways that we can encourage customers to migrate to these digital channels as opposed to the traditional channels, because it is in fact a very high um, cost element in the operation of banks. On the demand side, our customers, in terms of the level of financial literacy, um, in terms of the technological um, proficiency, um, they are having issues in terms of the various applications that we make available. We understand that. And this is what this education series is really about. Um, and of course, um, Ms. Frederick would have spoken about the trust issue. Um, and of course, education and sensitization will help in that regard as well. We also have situations where for many persons who are not necessarily um, holders of bank accounts, um, the reason is, is simply because the incomes are relatively small and quite volatile. So they see no reason to actually have a bank account. And that is in fact, you know, a major issue that we would have to, um, to deal with as we move forward into this digital space. Um, the risk, importantly, we, we know of the breaches of um, confidential customer information, identity theft and fraud. Um, Ms. Frederick would have spoken to these things. Um, breaches in terms of what we call know your customer, um, which is important in terms of being able to maintain our regulatory status as being uh, you know, institutions that are totally um, above board and who are compliant with international regulations as far as money laundering, and, and terrorist financing is concerned. Um, these are important issues to us as they are, as they should be to customers. And uh, of course, within any digital sphere, we have to ensure that KYC is not compromised. The issue of exclusion is a real risk in as much as we are saying that um, digital finance will in fact cause financial inclusion. It can also cause financial exclusion for the reasons that I mentioned earlier the level of literacy, um, you know, technological proficiency, you know, this can actually lead to persons opting out as opposed to persons opting in. And of course, there are unfair practices by unscrupulous um, institutions, which we don't have any of, I can see, amongst our, our, our grouping, but certainly issues of recourse. I mean, how does a customer who has um, encountered, you know, some disadvantage um, issue in using digital um, you know, media, how does that individual get some kind of recourse? What are the, um, you know, the, the, the agent liabilities um, that, that, that need to be um, pursued? And that is where consumer protection comes in. And let me just say that we are very happy for this collaboration with the Ministry of Commerce. Um, this is why we jumped at this opportunity and we re we're really hoping that this would be the start of many things to come. We really intend to make this a series of community um, engagements on issues that are relevant 
to banking and financial services. Because for us, it's about continuously empowering our customers, um, giving them the assurance that we have the data protection mechanisms for our laws. We do have a Data Protection Act. We do have, in terms of the regulations, um, specific amendments within our consumer protection law that ensures that even as we transition to digital channels, there are no loopholes um, within the legislation that will allow for our consumers to be exploited. So these are important enabling things um, that we as an association, and as I indicated, through dialogue and consultation with the ministry, with government officials, we would endeavor to ensure are in place. Government has a very big role to play in all of this in terms of the conducive legal and regulatory framework. Um, I wanted to speak specifically about the issues as it re relates to things like, for example, credit bureaus, um, which allows somebody to actually access finance by virtue of an assessment of their credit scores. Um, you know, and it, in, in terms of the long process of applying for a loan, I mean, where you have to submit all of this due diligence information, a credit score through a digital channel allows you to access a loan a lot quicker. It is the role of our government to put in place the appropriate legislation for the introduction of credit bureaus in our, in our country. And there is in fact a draft credit reporting bill. We also have a draft securities interest in movable, movable properties bill. And a lot of you will identify with the fact that when you're doing a loan, for example, a mortgage, you run down to the registry, you know, to get the appropriate um, documentation, the, the land registers, et cetera. We need to move to electronic registries so that this information can be accessed virtually. And like I said before, it's really not just about digital finance, it's really about a digital economy and all of the enabling elements of that digital economy. Um, and finally, of course, government could be a leader in terms of ensuring that we have, you know, a digital civil status registry. Our important departments like Inland Revenue Department, et cetera, are in fact totally, totally digital in many respects. So this takes me to the end. I will move on very quickly to my colleague, Gordon, who will take you through the regional payment system. Thank you. Thank you, Medford. Good evening, Jesse. Our friends are the, uh, the Consumer Affairs Department, uh, viewers, listeners, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to be speaking about the regional payment system and more specifically the, uh, Eastern, the Eastern Caribbean Automated Clearinghouse. The ECACH has been maybe one of the most significant developments that has taken place over the last decade within the ECCU. The, this, um, the ECACH is owned by, the, by all the banks in the member, eight member territories, and it's an electronic network. Can you change this like this? Next slide. Yes, yeah, an electronic network for clearing of checks and other electronic transactions. It was established in 2011, and like I said, owned by all the banks, and it's governed by the Payment Systems Act and the ECACH rules, which was issued by the ECCB. And it was really developed to provide a, a cost-effective or efficient clearance and settlement mechanism for retail payments that meets international standards. And very importantly, it is secure. Next slide. <clears throat> the EFT is an authorized transmission funds from which accounts um, from which funds are transmitted through accounts for the ECACH. It allows for funds from customers within the same institution, different institutions within the same country and across different countries. Uh, transaction information should include the name of the account, the account number and beneficiary financial institution, as well as the amount to be paid. Very importantly, Clients can initiate EFT transactions either online, in branch, or via mobile channels. And it allows for direct deposits, payrolls, social security benefits, 
tax refunds and pension. And secondly, direct payments, consumer bills, mortgage payments, insurance premiums, um, person to person payments or business to business um, payments. EFT is cheaper, is faster and more convenient option for sending and receiving money. And it's also a very good alternative to cash or checks. Um, move on, yeah. The, the EFT, in, just, to, just to give you some perspective, in 2021, the ECACH processed more than 6.43 million transactions valued at more than $27.52 billion. And this, this includes checks, which is 4.16 million transactions valued at 18.96 million, and EFT, 2.27 million transactions valued at 8.56 billion. So you will notice that the lion's share of the transactions going through the ECACH still represents checks. So checks represents the lion's share of those transactions. Yeah, um, checks in and of itself is a, is, has some inefficiencies in it. The ECACH, what they've done is that we've um, digitized checks and streamlined the, the clearing process so that checks no longer go through the process where you have a physical exchange of checks. Those checks, what is exchange is really the images, but still, because of the mere how it operates, it's still a very archaic system and, and creates a, lot, a high, high level of inefficiencies. EFTs, which is much more um, efficient, we while it's growing and it's growing at a significant rate, the, the reduction in checks is much slower than the rate of growth in EFTs. Um, the improvement in EFT, it's improving the payment system across territories and promoting more efficient commerce. And it's supporting the ECCB's plan to reduce its rel the reliance on cash. Prior to the ECACH, like I said, checks were clearing um, in a manual way. And it took up to three days for checks to clear. Inter-island or inter-territory checks took a couple of weeks. Through that process, the clearing process for checks whether on island or cross territories is the same. Presently, it's T plus one. That is, if a check is deposited in a bank today, it should clear within, within a, day, a, day of, a day following the deposit. So it's deposit today. You have to allow for checks to be returned through the system, which is by the second day, and customers should get value for the check by the end of the second day which means that on the third day, the morning of the third day, you should get value for your checks. With EFT, it's instant. So a transaction is put through the system and customers get value for the checks right away. Next slide. Next slide, please. Some opportunities that exist is that the we're looking for greater efficiencies in the network to enhance the, the settlement window. Presently, the settlement window ranges from 7, 15 in the, in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon. We believe that there's an opportunity to perhaps extend the, the settlement window to get closer to a 24 seven type of scenario. There is an opportunity to promote growth or enhancement in, um, in EFT usage. So, as I said earlier, there's a high level of reliance on checks, but understanding, appreciating the fact that EFT is a much more efficient uh, payment mechanism, we would like to see an improvement or an enhancement in the, in the utilization of EFT across the, across the network. There's also an opportunity for new products and services, whether it be direct debits, USD items, or uh, which would cause a reduction in checks. Currently, the ECACH is only an EC transaction, so it does not allow for clearing of USD items or for transmission of USD payments across the network. There's also an opportunity for a greater level of inclusion. Presently, the ECACH is available only to the commercial brand banks across the member territories. Uh, there's an opportunity for perhaps credit unions which is fast and growing across the region for their own participation in the ECACH, which will allow 
to a greater level of inclusion and more persons realizing the benefits of the ECACH. I will stop at this point, and obviously I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Gillian. Um, um, do we have the last word from... Yes, we have one final... Exactly, wonderful. Um, presentation on, on fees and charges um, to be delivered by um, Nigel. So Nigel. Yes, so thank you very much, uh, Medford, and a pleasant good evening to you, Ms. Leons, the colleagues from the Ministry of Commerce, Ms. Herman and Ms. Frederick, and of course, my fellow Bankers Association members, um, Gordon and Medford. And a special evening as well to our viewers and listeners. And I, I just want to spend a little time here this afternoon to, to share with you a little bit on the bank fees and charges. Now, we are a highly regulated uh, sector. Uh, of course, reasons being is a key sector in any economy in term of, terms of the financial sector. And um, where people's monies are concerned, um, you know, we have a great responsibility. As a result, we have uh, various regulators and guidelines, uh, standards that we, we have to observe. Now, as a licensed financial institution, we have to ensure and, uh, that we observe these guidelines strictly. Of course, this comes at a, at a huge cost to us, um, but it is the price cost of doing business. Um, included in that is the fact that, um, you know, we, in order to do business, we need to get deposits from the public and, and our clients. So um, again, a great responsibility that we have is to protect our depositors' money. It is the, the core of banking in terms of that we have a responsibility. We technically borrow money from our clients uh, and they, they entrust that responsibility to us. And we must then keep that uh, money safe. Of course, we must use that money to make available to persons who um, are in need of financing, be it individuals or businesses. And um, Having said that though, we have a cost associated with holding those funds. So for all savings held within the banking system, uh, within the currency union uh, governed by the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, we are required to pay all depositors 2% um, per annum on those deposits. Clearly, um, you know, it sort of is the, the, the foundation of part of the cost that we are, are faced with. So for instance, um, if, we, if we borrow $100 from a, a depositor and we are to lend it out to somebody else who wish to, to access funds for some purpose, and we must start with the fact that it's costing us 2% of that $100 already, not to mention, as I earlier spoke to, the cost of um, ensuring that we have a very robust um, framework in place to, to, to follow all the necessary uh, regulatory guidelines. Um, coupled with that, uh, we're in the business of lending money, and there is a risk associated with that. And that risk is that when we lend somebody money, they will not pay us back. Um, it is very expensive and time consuming to, to foreclose and recover funds that are being defaulted on. And once more, uh, of course, also facing the real risk of uh, not getting it back at all. So some of these things form the basis for which a bank would decide um, how they go about charging for their various products and services. You would appreciate as well that we are a business and somebody would have invested in this as a business and would expect some decent return on the investment. Um, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are a viable business because of our importance to the, to the economy 
And I think we all would be aware of the, the demise that a country can face if a, the financial sector is not stable and sound. So while we go about doing business, we have to ensure that we are covering the cost of doing business and that we can have some sort of a decent return for our shareholders and the persons who would have invested their capital. So that sort of gives you, a, a, in, in summary, part of what um, drives the, the cost of, of doing business with us. And I, I think it, it's fairly um, transparent in terms of when we talk about interest rates. I mean, we have seen rates tumble over the last few years from double digits for mortgages to most of us are running mortgages at, at 5%. Um, and of course, having said earlier that we started at 2% in terms of our minimum cost, which is what, which is what we are required to pay as the minimum savings rate, um, in between that is our other costs. And then of course, the fact that we need to try to um, turn a profit. Um, so I think that sort of summarizes and lays the uh, foundation for, um, you know, sort of the, the context of our being able to charge um, and the fact that we need to, to, to have those charges. Um, my colleagues would have spoken earlier to um, some of the initiatives that we're undertaking to try and allow for us to um, reduce and, and give um, you know, services that come at a, at a lower cost. Um, the digital products are definitely along those lines. Uh, a number of us in most cases offer most of our online banking and, and other digital products free of charge. And so we would encourage persons to capitalize on those options. Um, let me just talk a little bit also because um, the, the slide before us now gives a indication of the, the type of spikes that we see over time for in terms of non-performing loans where it's up to 20, 2013, 2014, we were in the region of, of high teens, early 20%. I mean, we've had to deal with in the, the last two years situations where um, we did moratoriums for clients because of the situation with COVID. That in itself has um, resulted in a number of organizations throughout the currency union, a number of fin licensed financial institutions having to uh, suffer significant losses over that period because of course clients would have uh, lost their jobs, economies uh, would have been closed for a period of time. And then the banks have had to suffer significant losses, loan losses in that area. So uh, we, when we take it into account, um, you know, how we operate, we have to factor all of those things in. And of course, we would be happy to, to shed some more light and to, to answer questions around concerns with, with uh, charges and fees. Um, so uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to be able to share this bit with you. And I'll hand it back over now to Ms. Leons to continue with this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Francis, Mr. Gillier, and Mr. Oliver from the Bankers Association of St. Lucia. Uh, thank you very much for your pres presentation, very sedating. Uh, establishing the working definition of digital finance and providing information on digital finance since its emergence, our, the national picture, the regional picture of the impact of uh, these digital utilities. Um, also providing insight on the regulations that guide the issuance of the much bemoaned bank fees and charges. Um, I, I, I know that we have many questions from uh, the individuals who joined the viewership at this time, but I, I first want to engage the panelists um, Ms. Frederick, uh, and also a question going out to Ms. Herman as well. Uh, how much, uh, we just heard an outline from the bankers in terms of the, 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 essentially the operations, what they are up against in terms of managing not only the resources that it takes to introduce uh, facilities uh, for digital finance and other services within the financial services sector, but also uh, the challenges that they encounter in terms of breaking even and, and, and 
the, making sure the investor reports are balanced. How does the National Consumers Association uh, take into consideration these, these challenges by the financial services sector in making determinations as to what is disadvantageous and what is not? I think, Jesse, it is always a, a balancing act. We, we know that uh, businesses, whether private sector um, or corporate, they're in the business of turning over a profit. So all businesses would like to see a return on their investment, um, whatever services that they may be offering to the public. But it must not be to the detriment of the consumers that they are expected to serve. It is very important that consumers understand the changes that are happening within the banking sector. And, I, and most times there is a, a divide between what is happening within the banking sector and what the consumers on the ground really understand and appreciate about the changes that are happening. How is it impacting the banking sector and the repercussions for the consumer? So um, I think uh, education and finance education and the changes that are happening are critical. I do not think enough has been done as it relates to educating the consumers so they understand the impact. Uh, so they have a uh, say so in the decisions that have implications for them. Because as a customer of a bank, um, the responsibility of the bank is to communicate with me, the consumer, to let me know that there is a change and the change has implications for me. I, as the consumer, need to understand what are those implications and the rationale behind the change. And it has to be a balancing act as well because it cannot be that we're putting fees on consumers that makes it very difficult for them. So could you imagine the man who's 78 years old who has to go to the bank and withdraw his few dollars that he has in the bank and to understand that there is always a charge or there is an, an inconvenience or the, the customer service is, is not the greatest. So on the part of the bank, there is a lot that they need to work on in terms of delivering the service to the customers and customer service is very critical. Banking charges are a huge issue with customers and we see all of the complaints online um, how consumers feel about those charges. And sometimes customers do not understand why, why, why those charges? Why must I pay $2 every time I go to the bank? Why if Bank of St. Lucia's 80, and, I, and I'm just using this as an example, I'm not throwing stones at Bank of St. Lucia. Why is that if the ATM machines are down at Bank of St. Lucia and I use another bank, why should the charge be $12? Why should you charge me $12 for using another ATM machine when the reason for your ATM machine being down is not my fault? So why should I incur that cost? Okay, we're going to get to um, the bankers addressing that matter in just a moment, but I first want to ask, and it's open to any of the bankers, and I just want to let everyone know that this is a conversation, a dialogue. I do welcome discreet interjections, piggyback, piggybacks, contest, and, and reinforcement um, among the panelists. But at first, I know there is a response. I am certain of it uh, to your, your statement, especially the tail end, but I first want to ask of the bankers, to, to what extent has the, the Bankers Association, and perhaps in your own respects at your own institutions, to what extent have you gone uh, in terms of ensuring that, uh, that digital finance takes care of, is consumer conscious, is taking into consideration the consumer? What measures have been put in place to ensure that there is consideration for uh, the, the average St. Lucia, the average resident of St. Lucia, all based on the metrics that you have on, on St. Lucians, on the residents of St. Lucia, their incomes and so on? Um, just see if you want to take that matter? Um, well, well, I'll start and you can always um, continue, um, Gordon. Um, I think we have gone through great lengths to ensure that the digital uh, channels that we have that that are available, um, you know, are brought to the average um, citizen of Saint Lucia. Um, it 
I mean, if you have to look at the, the benefits of these, um, of these digital channels in terms of the convenience, for example, um, you know, the fact that you can actually, you know, apply for a loan within the comfort of your home or the comfort of your office, right? I think it's very compelling. And I mean, we, we, we know of the, the, the travel cost involved in, you know, finding your way to Castries if you leave in say Ansley or Canaries or finding your way to Soufre where the nearest um, bank um, is located. We know that there is a travel cost to that. Um, the fact that these, these services are now available um, virtually um, is, is, should be very compelling for customers. We understand the challenges that persons may face in terms of not being comfortable with the channels, but we can assure you that banks invest quite a bit of money in, in those technologies to ensure that what we bring forward is in fact safe. Um, the, there's a lot of protection that in addition to the platforms themselves that are built into banking systems, okay, to ensure the safety and security of, 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 of you know, customer information and to ensure that your transactions are not compromised in any way. In any case, I mean, if anyone suffers a loss by virtue of the use of, a, of, of online or, or any other service, um, ultimately the bank is, is liable, okay? It is not you, the um, customer, that would be liable for such a loss. So in terms of your question, Jesse, um, you know, what are we doing in terms of getting our customers to use those channels? We believe that the education is important, bringing persons to the level of, of comfort that they need um, in order to access um, those, those channels. And we believe that it's, it's only a matter of time. I mean, look what, what COVID showed us. I mean, we were, we were forced. I, I can venture to say that we had a record number of um, applications for online services over the last two years as a result of the pandemic. Um, there will be other events that will force us to go digital, okay, whether we want it or not. Now, the traditional channels are very costly. Um, Gordon would have mentioned to you the, the fact that we have introduced the electronic funds transfer, which is, which, which is free. It means now that I in St. Lucia can now transfer money to a bank in St. Kitts, okay, to, to, to a beneficiary with a bank account in St. Kitts, um, seamlessly with no charge. There's absolutely no charge to doing that right now via electronic funds transfer. And you will have credit to that account the next day, okay? So this is very compelling. I mean, traditionally we use SWIFT um, wire transfers, which had a cost. Now this, this, is, this is free. So why should somebody write a check now, which now has to be physically um, tr um, transferred to send kits? Well, these days we scan and so forth, but still there is, there is more administrative work involved in processing a check than doing a transaction via say EFT. And what the administrative work entails or what it implies is that we have to have the staff to do that. Something that an electronic platform could do, we have to get four or five people to do in a back office somewhere, which puts a heavy burden on banks. So you would appreciate that when we say, okay, the fact that we have EFT, we are now suggesting to you that if you come to a bank to clear a check, that could otherwise, this payment could have been made via EFT. We are going to impose a $5 charge on you, which will help us offset the cost of having our tellers and, and, and clerks to process that, that check for you. Okay, and it's not just at our bank, it's also at the, at the other bank as well. So, uh, you know, there is a cost factor to banking. And um, I mean, I'm venturing a little here in suggesting that at the end of the day, banks are obligated to be profitable, okay? Our regulations mandate that we remain profitable. Um, and the, 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 the reason for that is that we need to ensure that our customers' deposits are protected, okay? And a profitable bank um, is what is going to ensure that, as well as the fact that um, 
our capital, which is really what we, we need um, or, or what gives us the legitimacy to operate as banks is not compromised through heavy losses. Jesse, if I could jump in here a little bit, Medford, before Gordon. I know Gordon has a point, but I kind of feel obligated to say this because I am the PR of the Bankers Association. And I know we have undertaken a very rigorous uh, education program, which started um, with, with this partnership we have with the, the ministry. And we have committed to, to doing more. So we, we agree that more can be done. And as, as, a, as individual institutions, we all um, have you know, programs where we educate our clients on those um, changes and platforms. As a matter of fact, we have an obligation to advise our clients of those changes and within a certain time as well, especially fee changes and other significant changes. But we are committed as a, an organization, an association to continue this education program. Uh, I think we, we, we use various social media platforms now. Uh, we still use some of the traditional mediums, but of course we have to reach everyone. And I know not everyone has access to the social media platforms that we, we speak about. I mean, so we have to, we have to look at the, the, the broader picture and how can we reach, um, you know, the person who don't have a phone that could have the WhatsApp or the, the Facebook or Instagram uh, or emails as for that matter. So, so we have a committee that we've set up, a special committee just to work on this program for the, the, the year. And that is our priority as this new executive. So let me just, um, I just wanted to interject there, Medford, to say that because I think that's important to, to get out there that uh, this is a stat. Uh, clearly, um, you know, that people are saying that they've not heard and they do not hear about these changes means that we have not reached all the persons that we should. So um, I wanted to make that point and I know Gordon also wanted to, to speak a bit. I hope I didn't steal your thunder there, Gordon, because I just felt I needed to, to, to make that point. I just want to stress um, the importance of what you just said there about the education and, and reaching everybody in society. Because my 80 year old grandmother who lives in London Road Dairy, so is not on Facebook, nor Instagram, nor WhatsApp nor is she listening to the TV. It may be required that you go into the community and engage the community at a town hall session in their community center and have a conversation with the persons you are not able to reach. But I think critical for us is education because we know there is a digital divide. Yes, everybody may have a cell phone, but not everybody knows how to go online and log into their online banking and check their money. My grandmother still has a book that she needs to walk to the bank, get it stamped, know that she knows her amount is in there, not that she needs to go on a computer. So this is another hurdle and another thing we need to remember. There's a particular um, niche within our community that still lives on the book that they have in their bags and that they will perhaps may take a while to get them to go online. And permit me, please, Jesse. I just wanted to add to what um, Vina has said. It um, highlights the consumer right to information. The consumer has a right to be informed. And uh, all what um, fellow panelists have said there borders on information sharing. There's not sufficient being passed on to our consumers, and we need to ensure that that is addressed at the soonest. Because the informed consumer can make wise choices. And again, you may see that redound into um, benefits that the bank can accrue. Greater membership, um, better PR concerning the banking sector. And we want to see that happen. All, all great points. I think the points I wanted to make, they were all spoken about, but certainly it highlights the importance of, um, of, of information um, sharing. You know, all the advancements that the banks make uh, we talk about some of the technological advancements. They are really made with the customer in mind to, to preserve you know, the security of the system, um, the efficiency and um, convenience um, for the customer. Uh, we recognize that not every customer is gonna be um, you know, technologically savvy. And in some cases, we have to adopt a different approach um, for those customers, you know, recognizing that there are different 
different um, position in the in the in the um, technology curve. Um, you know, a lot has been said about about fees, and I know um, Medford responded quite quite well to it. You know, I always say that banks really should not apologize for for making a profit, and and you don't really make a profit first and foremost for your shareholders. You make a profit for your depositors because nobody nobody on this call is going to put their money in a bank that is losing money. You want to go to bed at night and wake up next day, war not worrying about the bank that you have your money and it's going to go under, right? And, and that is why banks are required by law to publish their financial statements in the banking hall and on the website and has to have it gazetted so that everybody can look at the financial statements and see that the bank is financially sound and therefore their deposits are sound. Banking is, is unlike any other business where the bank is really owned, what, 5, 10% by the shareholders. The other 90, 95% is the depositors. So the banks is riding on the banks of, on the backs of the depositors. And therefore we have, a, we have a fiduciary responsibility to operate the banks in a safe and sound manner so that we can preserve the wealth of our nation. Um, in the Caribbean, in the ECCU, um, we, 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 we are the custodians of the majority of the significant portion of, of our wealth. Um, unlike in the US and elsewhere where you have the stock markets and funds are held in equities and all manner of things in the Caribbean, in the ECCU area, funds, our nation's wealth are held in deposits in the bank. And therefore we're gonna make sure that we operate our banks in a manner that will preserve the wealth of our nation, right? Um, with regards to the checks, you know, people are still holding on to the checks. Uh, we have a lot of people, um, companies who are paying their payroll by checks. That in itself is, it, it puts a lot of inefficiency in the system. On a Friday fortnight, the banking line is full. People come to catch the checks. When in fact, there is a very good alternative way of making those payments. Those payments can be done simply by using the, um, the EFT platform where customers accounts can be de deposited directly at any bank uh, within, within St. Lucia or anywhere. And at the end of the day, those customers only have to just take the ATM card, go in the ATM, and withdraw the money. Um, some of the fees are designed to promote uh, usage of the alternative delivery channels. Most banks that I know, there's no fees for using the ATM. There's no fees for using online channels. There's no fees for EFT, right? Uh, there may be a fee in some cases for coming into the bank to cash a check, but the alternative is to deposit that check at your bank. It doesn't have to be at the bank that the check is drawn at. It could be at your bank and allow the check to go through the clearing process where you could get value next day. Or even better, funds can be transferred, payments can be made via EFT and get away from the checks. So I've said a lot. I mean, there's a lot more to be said on this. God, if I could just add to that a little bit, two, two, two words that I heard earlier, I just wanted to speak to a little bit. Senior mm -hmm. citizens, senior citizens um, and uh, you know, a, a sector of our, our customer base that we, we respect greatly because uh, most of them have been uh, loyal to us for many years from when they had started um, or the relationship with us to the point of where they have become senior citizens. And we all have special consideration for senior citizens in terms of fees associated with their accounts. And uh, in some cases, most senior citizens uh, do a free banking with most of the, the organizations within the, the Bankers Association. So that much we, we have um, taken care of. And then one last point on the ABM that came up a bit earlier in terms of why uh, I believe it's Ms. Frederick mentioned about if one of our ABMs are done, as in, let's say I'm the representative for, for First Caribbean here. And I had a situation where our ABM in Sufre was done for quite some time. And uh, it, the concern was raised by a number of our clients there. And uh, a similar situation with a number of my colleagues. And when we spoke about it, our approach is similar. If my ABM is done in Sufre and um, Bank of St. Lucia ABM is used and the client incurs an additional charge for using that ABM, we normally refund the client that charge because we know that we could not provide that service at that time. My colleagues of, um, from the other the banks have said a, have taken a similar approach. I know when Gordon and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, he had some ABMs down. They use other banks' ABMs. Similarly, those charges, because of course those charges are paid on the client's account. It's fairly straightforward for us to be able to identify them within the period of time that our ABM was done. 
And so we, um, we understand as an association that we have a network of ABMs throughout the country from time to time because they're, they're machines. For one reason or the other, we will have uh, ABMs going down, but we, we, we say to people that there are options uh, with using our, our colleagues' ABMs from the other banks, and please reach out to your bank uh, to, to negotiate to have that fee reversed if you find yourself in that situation, because we're very flexible where that is concerned. So I just thought I would mention that in this forum. Um, I just like to that's very exciting. But what I recognize is that not many customers are aware of this information you. that you just shared. This because recently I've been monitoring Facebook and I see people post their issues relating to, to bank fees and when they go to a bank, what happens? That was one of the issues and hence why I raised it here today. But I'm, I'm learning about this firsthand in this forum. Not that I could go on your website in your frequently asked questions and say, here's the information and it's readily available and the public are aware that if presented with a circumstance such as this, there is an opportunity for me to get a refund. So the issue of, of education is critical. Yeah, we may know the information and we believe that persons are aware of what they should do if they confront with a particular situation. But there are many perceptions about what people know and in, act, in actuality, what they actually know. And, and there is also an issue of trust in banks. People's perception of the bank is that you're only taking from me and I'm not getting anything from you. So every time I use your ATM, you take $2. I go to the supermarket, you take another fee. I go over there, you take another fee. But what am I getting from you? If I may add, this calls for um, what we term full disclosure. Perhaps the banks can inform, perhaps through a, a pamphlet or something of that nature, indicating what their fees are and um, the reason for charging such fees and some information pertaining to avenues that can be sought, avenues that they can pursue to deal with certain matters when they, they're presented with those matters. Because it's a lack of information. Yeah, all about that is a lack of information. Sorry, Jesse. Just, so just, just to stick a pin. So the two points, there are several, several um, volumes happening here. So one, to uh, indicate, I did hear from Ms. Frederick and echoed by um, Ms. Roman, the lack of trust being a, a concern. So perhaps a, a response on perhaps the banks coming um, coming across or reinforcing a, a more humane presence uh, with the population and also what the procedures are for handling consumer complaints. And not just that there is a, 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 proceed, a pr procedure through red tape and bureaucracy, but rather something that is seamless and easy that if somebody has to use an ATM, another ATM instead of their own bank's ATM, that there is a line that they can call, there is an email that they can send to a particular email address where they would get a speedy response and it would not be delayed or um, having the person be discouraged by having to go through all of these measures to recoup, you know, a five to ten dollars. Mm. On the matter of, um, fee, of the transparency um, point that was raised by Ms. Herman, it's, it's actually, um, the, well, the, set, the ECCB or regulator, they, are, they, are very, they, are, they take a very active interest in, in fees and, and full disclosure by, by banks. It's actually one of those requirements that we must, we must adhere to, where we must publish um, our schedule of fees and charges. Our schedule of fees and charges is published in two places. Um, on our own individual websites, as well as the ECCB website. Every year, banks are required to provide the schedule of fees to the ECCB. And what ECCB actually do, they have a side-by-side -side comparison of those fees, and that information is available on the ECCB website, in addition to, um, to information that's available on the bank's um, own website, so that there's full, full disclosure of those things. Um, you asked about complaints um, and the process for, for dealing with complaints. Again, that is one of those things that is a, is, is, is a, is a matter that is of, of interest to, the, to, the set, to our regulators and banks are required to have a, a process in place for receiving complaints, 
for tracking those complaints and for resolving those complaints. So every bank have that process in place where complaints are received directly, either by telephone calls or by emails. Um, banks even some banks even have a process where they scan social media sites, so Facebook chats and IG chats and so forth, and and those information um, is handled. They are handled. Is handled, and customers may receive a direct message um, from the banks in response to the queries that they would have raised, and that information is logged within the bank, and we track to see how how well and how quickly um, they are they are resolved and they are addressed. So there's a process in place for that. Um, there isn't at this point in time a process, a nationwide process where at, at the bankers association level where, where customers can log their complaints at a central, central authority. As it is right now, those complaints are logged at the individual bank level. Yeah, and, and before, um, before Ms. Frederick um, asks a question, Jesse, if you permit me, um, this last point that um, Gordon made um, is something that we, we, we've heard quite a bit of, of late, um, that if there are issues that are not specific to any one bank, um, and it, it, it pervades the sector as a whole, um, where can one take those issues? And um, certainly the Bankers Association um, have, you know, has taken note of this, and it is something that we will be deliberating on in, in the weeks to come with a view to putting in place some form of um, system where we can actually um, receive complaints and um, have a proper resolution, um, you know, a, a plan of action to deal with, with all of those complaints that come, that come in um, as it relates to issues that are sector-wide. Thank you for that, Mr. Francis. I just... Jesse, just too quick from me before you, you jump mm -hmm. in. Um, in relation to the complaints, um, I, I would agree that all institutions has a avenue for dealing with complaints in a complaints handling process. But when it is a customer wants a refund for 250, is expected to wait on a line outside the bank for one hour, gets into the bank and has to wait another hour in order to lodge his complaints to get a refund for 250, you can see where the issue lies, right? Appreciating that there is a complaint process, but there are challenges in navigating that complaint process in terms of the time frame in which it, it has to be dealt with for just $2.50, two hours, one hour on a line outside and one hour on a line inside. Um, in relation to the issue of full disclosure and publishing of the fees, on the bank's website, as well as the ECCB website. Um, not many people go to the ECCB website to access information on fees. And not many people go to your website to access information on fees. So there should be other avenues by which we reach the populace to inform them of the changes and uh, to hear what they have to say, say on, on those changes because consumers always feel I don't have a voice in the changes that affect me. And to a large extent, when changes are made from a banking sector standpoint, the consumer does not have a, a, a voice as to yeah or nay, I, I want those changes. I don't want the changes. I don't have a voice because those changes are made at a level where the consumer is not engaged at the ECC level. And our local governments who are part, who are aware of some of those changes, um, sign off on those changes and don't really take into consideration the implications to those cons consumers. So hence why I, I suppose the con national consumers come, come, come into play in terms of lobbying and advocating on behalf of the consumers, engaging the relevant stakeholders and having the, the right conversations so that we can work hand in hand in order to deal with those issues and bring those issues to your attention. Because it may be at a particular level, you believe that this is the process, but whether the process is really effective from the bottom up, your guy who's a CSR on the ground dealing with the complaints, whether he's doing it in an effective manner is a question mark. Just a, just a point of clarification though, Ms. Frederick, the, the matter of fees is not a matter that is determined at the, at, the, at the regional level or the ECCB level. 
um, fee changes is determined at, a, at an individual bank level. However, there's a requirement that before any fee comes into effect, uh, banks are required to give at least 30 days notice um, to customers. So, so what I spoke about with regards to fees being available online, it, it, deals, it, it addresses your existing um, schedule of rates and fees. However, where there are changes that are contemplated to those fees, then customers must be advised to advise um, and given a 30 day time frame, either by way of email, written correspondence, um, publication in the media or whatever the case may be. Customers must give that, be given at least 30 days notice before those changes can, can take effect. Now, um, you raised the point about the um, coming in line for two hours to, to with regards to 2050 cents um, uh, query. And again, you know, coming joining the line is just one, it's perhaps the most ineffective way to raise a query for bank. And we would highly recommend that, that where queries exist, you either call the bank or send an email um, to the bank, or if you, are, you want to write a letter, I mean, that, that's, that's an option. But, but some customers just feel that they have to come to the bank um, to raise, raise a query. Uh, and like I said, it's the most effective way to do that. And just to add, Mr. Julia, um, we have seen the, the effect of the pandemic on bank lines being longer. So this would not right. have been the modus operandi of these right. institutions pre-pandemic. It is, it is because they themselves are impacted quite often by the pandemic in one way or another. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, does the Bankers Association, or ask rather, does the Bankers Association or individual banks have, have you considered perhaps in, in moving toward this more humane impression um, by the public? Because we've seen other institutions apparently waging war on being more humane and loving and you know, appreciative and conscious of the, of, of the common man. Um, we've heard tonight so far that banks not only impose fees and charges to earn a profit, but also to protect the interests of the depositors. Um, is there any consideration for moving forward with a campaign or an, an effort to get the public to understand that it is more than just a capitalist endeavor? It is also to look out for the best interests of everyone who has a stake, including the population who, who is a member who makes deposits to hopefully begin to engender a sort of, I'm with this bank and I need to understand what this bank is doing because they're helping my interests. Yes, Jesse, um, and you, you are quite correct. And I'm, I'm hoping that this evening will really be a start of that conversation. Um, one of the things I think is important that we indicate is the fact that we have seen what has happened in terms of the interest rate on loans over the last, say, eight years or so. Um, I think all of us would agree that the interest rate on loans have, have actually gone down um, considerably. I think um, some eight years ago, we were probably doing mortgages at about eight or seven and a half percent. Now, the average is probably closer to five, five percent. Um, Nigel would have mentioned the fact that we are, by, by, by regulation, we are to maintain the minimum savings rate of 2%. So what it means is that the bank's margins have been compressed significantly, okay, in terms of the main line of revenue, which is really the interest income on loans, okay? So with this decline in margin, banks, in order to remain profitable, have had to look at non-interest income streams. And certainly the, 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 the fees associated with transactions is, one, is, is certainly one option. Um, at the end of the day, there is the, the, the administrative cost to banking, as I indicated earlier. There is, of course, the tremendous investments that we make in technology, our, our banking systems, all of these have to be offset. And, um, you know, it is, it is really not a situation whereby the banks can literally give everything away um, for free. Um, Nigel would have also mentioned a significant cost that banks are carrying right now. It is the, 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 the cost of actually um, making provisions for loan losses. Every time a loan goes into default or becomes non-performing, 
a bank has to make an adjustment, okay, um, for that loan going bad, which effectively reduces on your profitability, okay? It is, it, it, it is something that undermines what we call the capital adequacy of a bank, okay? And um, as a result of that, you know, banks could actually find themselves in a situation where they're not meeting the minimum um, capital requirements that is stipulated by our regulators, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. So this is what we are guarding when we seek to be profitable, we seek to minimize losses, we seek to recoup all of the costs of our technology, our platforms. This is what we are guarding. We are actually ensuring that we have a viable institution that will remain in operation. Um, so Jesse, to your question, we, we really need to um, accelerate the public discussion on those issues. And um, as I indicated, we are hoping that this would be the start of many more to come. I think Ms. Frederick indicated that we need to go down, we need to get to the ground and get to specific groups, um, groups who may not necessarily be part of a forum like this this evening. And I think at the last discussion that we had um, with the Ministry of Commerce, we did give an undertaking that we will meet with our farmers associations. Okay, we will meet with our, our um, taxi associations if we have to, to explain the issues to them um, in a very clear way so that they can understand. And I think importantly in all of that, what banks have been doing is giving customers options. Yes, we public our, um, publish our fees and all of that, but you will find that for a lot of transactions which attract a fee, there is an alternative to getting that transaction executed. And um, the fact that you have this notice period of 40 days um, for, before fees come into effect gives you the, 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 the leeway where you can explore those other options. So it's, it's quite a bit, um, Jesse, and you know, we are committed to continuing that discussion um, with the general public. Okay, I want to 180 right back to digital finance. <laughs> um, uh, talking about uh, cybersecurity and managing some of the risks that are associated with uh, digital finance and talking about the consumer uh, in terms of the consumer being impacted and dealing with uh, scams, hackers, what have you. What measures, what safeguards uh, have been put in place and also taking into consideration perhaps the outsourcing of um, companies who would provide the fintech service. Speak to us about these safeguards that are put in place to protect the consumer uh, who is using a Bank of St. Lucia app on their phone, should they you know, be attacked? Yeah, so Jesse, it is mandatory that banks invest in proper cybersecurity systems. Um, I don't think that, that you will be able to operate without ensuring that these are in place. Um, and they're quite robust in that regard. We, we do a lot of what we call um, penetration testing. Um, certainly the staff of banks would, would say to you that, you know, um, it is something that is quite common. And what we saw certainly over the period of the um, pandemic was a proliferation of cyber attacks um, on financial institutions and other institutions um, you know, throughout the world. Um, certainly um, there was the opportunity and you know, obviously the, the unscrupulous elements um, you know, took advantage of it. Um, in our region, you would, you would note that there has not been any significant issue in terms of a cybersecurity um, attack um, or threat. And that's because um, the cybersecurity um, protection that we invest in are quite robust. Um, I could say that, and along with the, the, the penetration testing that we do, um, where we actually um, deliberately send, you know, emails to, to staff and, and see whether or not they would actually fall prey to it by opening a link, that sort of thing. It's something that we, 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 we take very seriously in that if persons repeatedly fail 
those penetration tests, then you know, they could be called up. And um, one of the things we emphasize as well is training of our staff to ensure that they're aware of what the red flags are in terms of the various attempts, whether they be phishing attempts, whatever the case may be. We sensitize our staff um, to these on a very regular basis. In fact, it's part of the mandatory training for a lot of our financial institutions that staff do the cybersecurity training. So I say all of this to give you the assurance that there are measures in place to ensure that our systems remain protected. Um, cybersecurity threats are a real issue, um, not just within our sector, but you know, in all sectors. And um, as financial institutions, it's something that we take very seriously and we have invested um, heavily into. Just, just to add, though, uh, just to add, uh, so, so um, to, to just put it to what Medford indicated, so while the banks have invested heavily in all the cybersecurity systems and so forth, a chain is as strong as its weakest link, link. And oftentimes, the weakest link in the process, in the system, is at the customer's level themselves. Where, where customers may not be as vigilant as they should and, and uh, let the guard down and share the password or click on link. For example, if you have a Netflix account, don't click on an email asking you to verify your Netflix information, right? So, so customers fall, fall for that kind of stuff, right? And, and uh, as a result of that, they expose themselves to, to that level of vulnerability where the account is compromised. So those hackers get, get access to the account and they may send an email to the bank asking the bank to carry out certain instructions. Now, luckily for the bank, what we do, much sometimes to the, to the annoyance of customers, is that when we get emails or, or instructions, we follow up with a call, just a call back. And customers may say, well, I mean, don't you know I send the thing? But we have to do that to protect, those, to protect our customers. So, I mean, a lot can be said about, about cyber security. But what I would say is that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. So, uh, and customers cannot take enough precautions to protect their, to protect their, um, their accounts and, and, and their assets. And, and yes, responsibilities. Jesse, if I just jumped in, in here also, um, we as the Consumer Association, as the Bankers Association, Consumers Department have a responsibility also to educate consumers about their online practices which leaves them open to potential threats and attack. Most times persons use unsecure networks, they use several devices, and um, they're clicking here and there, but they're not educated about the risk um, that they themselves are opening up themselves to. In relation to going back to what uh, Medford- but, but said, we just to interject, there is definitely an, an, an obligation on the part of the consumer. Agree. Agreed. To be informed. But not all consumers are familiar with what is phishing or understand what phishing is. Number one, they can't spell the word phishing. They would spell it F-I-S-H-I-N-G, not P-H, yeah? So, so that's, that's another issue as well. So, so we can see why it would be our responsibility as well as the consumers. But as the people who are offering the service, and encouraging consumers to use the, the online platform and, and, and operate in the digital space, largely we have a responsibility. Yeah. And and I was also thing. happy to see that one of the banks had a two-step authentication where you go online and then you get a password into your email. But I also realized that at some point for a couple of days, the two-step authentication was not working. So I was not receiving the code in my email um, and the bank never sent out an email to say, okay, the system is down, we're working to fix it. But during that time, there is a risk because the two-step authentication was no longer working, but the bank had not informed the public that we are having some challenges as it relates to that two-step authentication, which we are working to fix. So herein also like issues, yes, the bank say they are doing, but there are also opportunities where instances where the bank drops the ball and there is room to leave consumers exposed. And just one example that I myself experienced, and I emailed the bank to let them know that the two, there is an issue with the two-step authentication, but I never got a response. Uh, no, Jesse, no, permit no. me, please. 
to, yeah. add, um, to lend support to what Vina has said. At the point of issuing the cards, I think the bank has a responsibility to let the customer know that they can be vulnerable if the pin is exposed and things of that nature. There's a lot of um, PR that can be done between the customer relations officers at the bank and the consumer receiving that card. You can start there when you're issuing those cards. As um, Bina said, they may not know of the, the risk involved. They may just be the, that they have a card and they can, it's easy access to their funds. But it's, it's a lot more than that. And we know the challenges that they can face. Yeah, so Mr. Mr. How consistent is this with international standards for um, provisional information to a customer walking in to receive their debit card or just coming in for a service, re receiving these disclaimers, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Mr. Gillian? Yeah, um, could I? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah um, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Ms. Ms. Harman is correct, but um, it, the reality is we provide that information. Not only do we provide it as a, in writing to the clients when we hand over those debit cards, when the, the onboarding process takes place, our officers talk through the, the challenges, the risks, as well as um, from time to time, we send out to clients correspondence to that effect. Should there be any new, um, you know, any one of those new tricks in the trade, so to speak, that we believe that they may be vulnerable to. So yes, it is part of our ongoing um, education, but it's also part of the initial onboarding. And for instance, when you do um, online banking, there's a whole list of do's and don'ts that advise as to what the procedure you should follow to protect yourself. Um, for the banks that have mobile apps, uh, quite often when you log into your mobile app, if there is any change in terms of uh, bank fees, any change in terms of um, the bank wanting to give you a notice to advise you to, to be aware of what might be at, out there at risk, um, that put you at risk, that pops up first. Um, sometimes to the annoyance of customers and a lot of them just click pass it because it comes up before you get your transactions done. And I see Ms. Frederick nodding her, her approval there because... I myself find it a little annoying sometimes, but you have to go through those because that's our way of advising you, hey, be on the lookout for this, or we're going to change this fee, or here's what is a change that's important to you. Contact your uh, relationship manager, or your branch or whatever. So yes, we do have systems in place that endeavor to advise our clients of all those measures to protect themselves. Uh, but some of our people just click past it they don't listen, they're, they're, they're more consumed with getting the card and going to the ATM or going to the store than really reading it. And again, part of the challenge we have is all people, and I mean, I'm not speaking here about the fact that you maybe don't like the social media platforms. We simply also don't read because we get a letter with a card that invites us to read, to see the do's and don'ts. And most people leave the letter in the envelope, pop the card, once they've pinned the card and activated it, they pop it in their wallet and they're ready to go. They believe they're fully equipped to do business. So that's the challenge we face. But again, we are working to see if we can um, keep our clients educated and informed that they really need to, to, to be aware of these things once they're do, using those um, services. We're running out of time, but I quickly, I want to get from Ms. Gorman. We will hear from um, you, Ms. Julian, and Mr. Julian in just a moment, but Ms. Gorman, I want to hear from you before we wrap up on the um, some of the policy frameworks. We've heard from the service providers as well as the, um, the representatives of the consumers uh, on some of the issues and concerns. What is happening at the middle ground in terms of policy frameworks at the national and regional level that support consumer rights in this digitization of the financial services sector? Ms. Herman? My mic was muted, sorry. No um, I remember in 2015, there was a regional move to get um, e-commerce legislation passed within the region. But that has not been um, fine-tuned within St. Lucia, I should think, and another, a, a number of the other member states. But there's a move towards having e-commerce legislation in place. I'm pleased to say that we have the Consumer Protection Act, which governs the whole, um, which gives guidance, I should say, to the businesses in terms of the parameters within which 
they can conduct business. It, it speaks to fair trading terms. It speaks to making sure that a, a bill is issued and things of that nature. And it also seeks to protect our consumers, first and foremost. Um, there's also um, within the region, I think there's the, within St. Lucia, I should speak to the, the credit reporting bill, as was mentioned by Mr. Medford and Mr. Francis, that um, I'm, I'm not sure if our legal officer is with us, but he can speak a little bit on that area. And another, there's another piece of legislation with respect to the securities that too is being addressed. And the legal officer is there, he can probably speak to that. But that's um, where we are in terms of making sure that our consumers and those who deal with digital finance, digital banking, um, their issues can be addressed and their issues can be, can receive some sort of protection using those pieces of legislation. Okay, we're getting some queries, comments, commendations from our viewers. Uh, we have one, the automatic alerts feature, which sends an SMS text message or email to a customer's mobile phone each time a debit or credit card transaction occurs is quite useful in detecting fraudulent transactions. Uh, we also have a question, um, why is it that, sorry, why do consumers have to pay $25 for a mortgage interest letter to file taxes? Why not email the letters to the customers? Why is there a charge? Is this a tactic that's discouraging uh, that sort of physical um, dispensation, bankers? I mean, what I would say in general is that, um, you know, these this services, it takes some effort um, by the bank. You know, so the bank normally, in the past, banks, they, they lend, at 10, 12 percent, and the and the 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 the, the, the deposits at four percent. Those days are gone. The um, interest spreads are so thin now, and based on the higher cost of operation now, with compliance costs and technology costs and so forth, um, banks have had to change the banking model. And what is happening now is that you know for services that is offered by the banks, a fee is imposed for for those for those um, services. And like I said, I mean there's full full disclosure those uh, fees are, are properly disclosed for customers. So it does have a specific, specific fee for the mortgage letter. I mean, I cannot comment on that, but in general, I mean, banks, they do charge a fee for the services that they offer. Okay, noted on that. Um, Mr. Shilley, you wanted to make a point earlier. I think we, it's not lost to time. No, I mean, you know, we, we, could, we could move on. It was re really just a point um, piggybacking on what Nigel said, but I think we move on from that. Okay, um, based on our pre-event meetings, uh, you would know panelists that we have more than exceeded our time this evening. Um, I now open the floor for final comments before we wrap up. That's what you want to go first? So, um, so, you know, it was indeed a pleasure. Um, participating in this program this evening. Um, like I said in the beginning, we're really hoping that this could be the start of, of many such engagements to come. Um, you know, we are committed to this partnership. We believe that um, the Consumer Affairs Department of the Ministry of Commerce and the National Consumers Association are strategic partners um, as far as public education and sensitization is concerned. We know you have a ready um, audience and we want to take advantage of where you are positioned in order to um, disseminate important information um, to consumers. So, you know, I just wanna thank the Ministry of um, Commerce for extending this invitation to us this evening. And um, just to say that we look forward to um, a lot more such engagements. Um, from, where, from where I sit, I just want to say that the, the banks have a very important role to play in the economic and financial development of our countries, a role that we take very, very, very seriously. We understand that there is a lot of, um, there's some negative perceptions uh, about bank and, and, and fees and certain things. Um, and we recognize that we have to go out there and tell our story. Um, banks, are, all the banks here present are very active. Um, not only, we see ourselves not only um, accepting deposits and lending money, 
But beyond that, you know, things like our corporate social responsibility. I know all of us are very, very active in terms of supporting the very important sectors of our economy, whether it's sports, whether it's education, whether it's health, um, you know, so many different things that we involve in. And we'll continue to do that because we believe that where, where the economy goes, that's where we go. Where our customers go, that's where we go. Where our small businesses and our, and our, our, our material businesses go, that's where we go. And we'll continue to play that, that supportive role in the economies that we operate and continue to operate on the premise of full transparency and, and really being the guardian of you know, mm -hmm. um, customer protection and, and so forth. We continue to hold those principles there near and dear to our heart. And we'll continue to do all that we can to ensure that those principles uh, live on you know, um, to the, our development and so forth. So thank you, it's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed the interaction today. I enjoyed uh, the questions that were, that were raised, really, really enjoyable. We're looking forward to many more of those sessions um, in the future. And just to round off on the, from our side, um, it, it was indeed my pleasure as well to be a part of the forum this afternoon. I think it's, uh, it's, it's significant that it comes at this time and um, we're really looking forward to future engagements. Um, I also wanted to just uh, put it in here that banks, while it may sound like the stoic type of building and, and everything else, banks have been run by human beings just as any other institution. And, and you know, it is a matter of um, you know, people engaging people and reaching out to us. And, and, and part of the, 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 the core of what we do is how we interact with our clients. And we have people who work at our institutions who are husbands, wives, daughters, sons, uncles, and human beings in the communities. So uh, we would also want to try and uh, remove the stigma that the bank is, you know, this, it's human beings that work at the banks. And I believe that um, similar to yourselves, um, they would also have that type of understanding that we need to um, reach out to, we need to understand, we need to provide for clients, understand their needs and try and understand the challenges that they face. So we're committed to ensuring that not just as a, an organization, i.e. the bank as an association, but as individual banks and the individuals who work within our institutions, that we, are, we see ourselves as having a responsibility to reach out to our clients, to engage with our clients, to ensure that they fully understand what they're getting into and that we do the best that we can to ensure that they're protected and they can make the best use of the products and services that we offer uh, throughout, throughout the network of banks here in St. Lucia. So thank you very much once more. It was a pleasure also being online with the other facilitators. I really, really very much appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Frederick? Thanks, Jesse. Um, it was a pleasure to be um, part of this panel. Um, uh, the Consumers Association will continue um, to advocate on behalf of uh, the consumers of this country who are affected by some of the policy initiatives, whether it's from the banking sector, tourism sector, or, or any of, of the sectors where um, consumers are, are impacted. This is something we take uh, very seriously. A common thread in our conversation this evening is the need for greater public education and sensitization and, and reaching out to people, not just uh, on social media platforms, but being able to reach out to people in the outer districts, in the, in the communities where you have persons who are, are not on, on, on social media and, and it's, it's not possible to reach them. We understand that there is a, a digital divide that has to be um, overcome um, as we move towards um, pushing people to go online and that may be part of the challenge and being encountered by the banking sector but with that there comes opportunities um, and, and I hope the bank can find those opportunities but the consumers should always be top of mind and I'll just like to say to I know we have about 97 participants on on this call we at the Consumer Association are um, pushing for a membership drive to get uh, persons to become members of the National Consumers Association. So feel free to drop in at our offices at Sans Souci or to call us as to 
uh, find out what is the process for becoming a member of the association because we are great in numbers and I think it's critical that we have a common voice in um, lobbying and championing for, for the com consumers of the, this country. So I'd like to encourage persons to, to reach out to us from the National Consumers Association. And if you have a complaint, uh, feel free to also reach out to us as well. Um, we do take on complaints and, and intervening on behalf of, of consumers in, in that regard. Thank you very much, Jesse. And last but not least, uh, Ms. Herman. Thank you very much, Jesse. Like um, my predecessors, it has been a very informative evening. I did enjoy the healthy discourse. Um, I would say thank you to the panelists for welcoming our invitation, accepting, sorry, our invitation to be able to bring information on the banking sector, the transition from the traditional services into mobile, not mobile, into digital banking, and for them to get an understanding and appreciation of where the banks are, and also for the bankers to know where they are falling short so that they can bridge that gap to be able to meet the needs of our consumers. As um, Vila said, there is the dire need to be able to go into the different um, locales, I should say, to meet the different um, stakeholders and to be able to explain to them at a level that they can understand. That is very, very important to be able to reach them and for them to get a grasp. Not using, not going back to the same digital setting to be able to get that information, but in a manner that they can comprehend. And um, from the perspective of the government, being a regulator, we will seek to ensure that the necessary legislation, the legal parameters that need to be in place are put in place to guide that process and to ensure that whatever is done within that sector, be it the banks or even the credit unions, that it is accessible to consumers, is consumer friendly, that they need to address and are being protected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Perman, for that. Uh, one final comment coming from our viewers, the persons who have tuned in, registered, and actually showed up tonight to be part of this event. Uh, from Anselm, all banks should have easily accessible online platforms to allow customers to complain about poor service. And hopefully to um, commend uh, for um, good service as well. But um, definitely the point taken, and it's something that we had discussed uh, earlier on in tonight's uh, proceeding, to remove any red tape that may be associated to really making uh, someone who has to voice a concern despondent. Uh, this has been a consumer education event on digital finance organized by the government of St. Lucia through the Consumer Affairs Department in partnership with the Department of Bankers Association of St. Lucia, as well as the Consumer, Associ consumer Affairs Association. Uh, tonight's proceedings, uh, we've definitely seen much coming out of tonight in terms of most, most of all the presentation made by the three bankers. And we thank you very much for elucidating us a lot of the information new. Some of it, you know, I have seen, I'm sure the others who joined in have seen before, but it all helped to paint a picture to give us a better understanding of what our digital finance space is like right now. And also hearing from uh, our Director of Consumer Affairs within the Department of Consumer Affairs, Harriet Herman, thank you very much for weighing in, um, opening first of all, and weighing in on the the work that has been done in terms of setting up regulations, policy framework that will guide, govern, protect our consumers uh, in the middle. And also uh, Ms. Frederick representing, Lena Frederick representing the National Consumers Association. Speaking on the, the consumer perspective, the customer perspective, we definitely appreciate that. And hopefully this can be as indicated something to continue hearing more of the concerns that I can definitely see based on the bit of research that I conducted that this subject matter is inexhaustible. So hopefully we can begin to have this conversation and really, really attempt to address some of the concerns with respect to uh, the digital finance space here in St. Lucia and ensuring that it is fair. So this has been an activity as part of activities to observe World Consumer Rights Day today, March 15th. And, you know, it's like the icing on the cake. 
I definitely enjoyed this evening. I hope all 93 participants and you enjoyed tonight's um, activity and you go forward with a renewed mind. And as the, 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 um, the call, the clarion call went out from Ms. Frederick that you do join the Consumers Association and keep your eyes and ears, your eyes peeled, ears out for uh, the work, any, any work coming out from the Bankers Association in terms of improving and increasing the word on information because there is work happening. It's just for the dissemination of information to be a bit more effective. Thanks again, Ms. Perman, Mr. Gillian, Mr. Francis, Mr. Oliveira, Ms. Frederick. We really do appreciate your time. Thank you for availing yourselves for this occasion. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope it is a restful. My name is Jesse Leonce. And of course, do stay tuned for more coming from the Bankers Association of St. Lucia, as well as uh, the Department of, I'm talking a lot, <laughs> the Department of Consumer, Consumer Affairs. It is important. Do look out for that. Keep posted. Do enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.